Very good morning, Dr. Thomas. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Yeah, I'm you? Good. welcome. Welcome to this program. Thank you very much for inviting me. <laughs> yeah, uh, we'll be waiting for a few more minutes, then we'll start. Yeah, yeah no worries. No worries. That's okay. I hope we are doing, we are doing fine. Yeah, actually, that was my first question. How how is the situation in India? I, I think it's, it's it's getting complicated, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And so I hope that everyone stays safe and you don't have somehow managing uh, every one of us. Like that is the yeah, yeah. It's uh, like crazy. It's it's like everywhere. It's uh, we need to. Be careful and 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 uh, try to expose us uh, less to this uh, disease. Um, um, I am vaccinated already, so I I'm, 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 I'm should be good. But we don't know. We never know. So it's uh, better to keep the biosecurity levels as in a control. Fortunately, we, we we know that world uh, work very well in our world. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, for us, for us, biosecurity is is a, is a daily job in in the work. So uh, I hope that we could apply that also for our life, <laughs> right? Exactly. Doctor Gopal, good to hey, see you. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Doctor Gopal. Ah, yeah. it's good to see you, my friend. Yeah, after a very, very long time. How are you? Yes. Not too bad. I'm, I'm healthy. I'm good. My family is all right. So very, I very, cannot complain. Very nice. Very nice to see you after yes, so yes, many yes. days, Day, months, yeah. and years. Yeah, yeah, many years. Many years. That, that's <laughs> indeed. Uh, but good friends always stay together. That's true. That is true. That is right. Yeah. So, how, how, how is Florida? Good. Um, I think uh, here is amazing. Uh, they are the, the rate of vaccination is, is is incredibly good. Now there is no everyone can got the vaccines. Uh, even my kids got the first shot already. Okay. Um, no lines. You go walk in and you get your shot. You walk away five five minutes and you're okay. done. Yeah, and uh, it, it's 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 now so 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 easy to get the vaccine here that people from other countries are coming to okay. get the vaccine here. Yeah. yeah, yeah, more more vaccines, less number of people there. Yeah, yeah. Now it's the problem that people don't some part of the population do not want to get the vaccine, and that is, is a threat for everyone. Yes, it is turned to be a political thing, and uh -huh. uh, that's yeah. why you know. So uh, when, when you mix health and science with politics, it's not good. Ah, <laughs> that's true, that is true. Right, so, um, but no, 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 it's, it's, it's good. Uh, the cases are going down. Uh -huh. All the activities are starting now to uh, reopen the economy. Uh -huh. uh, actually, actually, right, it's, 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 it's incredible, but it's not easy to get, uh, to find people to, 
to do the jobs, you know? So um, there is, we have a score, some, some, some kind of a, a <laughs> shortage of people for, for field work. Uh -huh. yeah, but, uh, that's life. Mm, that's true. Uh, people, I think people still are afraid to go and, and work outside home, which I, I, I do. I, I, I mean, I cannot say anything. I think I agree. That's why field, field work is, 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 is not easy to find. So um, let's see. Let's yeah, see. that's true. <laughs> And how, how is your work life? Good, good. I mean, um, uh, you are muted. Thomas, you are muted. Oh, I am, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah not quite. Sorry. Uh, I didn't. Uh, I'll come. Okay. No, uh, the, the the in Regal we are doing well, growing uh, uh, in terms of, of economical value. Okay. Um, already with with breeding programs in each of the countries where we operate uh, uh -huh. for black and red tilapia. On Sayakwa also very good. A lot of uh, <laughs> success in China. Yeah. We had a very good momentum in India. Mm -hmm. uh, but now with the situation, of course, all the all the cells are pushing down, unfortunately. Okay. And then uh, you know the the in India when you want to sell breeders, uh, you, they have to go through the quarantine facility mm -hmm. in, in Chennai, mm -hmm. uh, and they are going to close and shut down for for almost two months. So uh, I think. Uh, that will affect us, of course, a lot in the cells. Okay. Um, and also, of course, it seems that in the hatcheries, people are also reluctant to go to work. Uh, farm Farms are not buying the, the seed, the post larvae, because also they are afraid. So it's, it's, it's a tough, it's tough situation in India mm. uh, due to the, the, the health situation. Uh, but China, Indonesia, Thailand, and in, in and Malaysia, they are doing well. We are start now our business in in, in Egypt. I uh, think mm -hmm. it's growing and well. Small things in Europe, small thing in 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 Middle East, but well, working every day to be better. Yeah, <laughs> that is so great. That is so great. Listening about your development growth and uh, business and sales yeah. and marketing and everything including yes. science yes so what so, about you what, what uh, so you you are now the big guy now in England, right <laughs> 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 very good it's uh, it's, yeah. it's I, I, you, you deserve it of course yeah. yeah i i thought that when when we are having the friends like you we can interact and uh, our students and faculty members will also get the exposure and advantage of your uh, experience yeah actually uh, that is a, it's a it's going to be a very broad um, presentation on, on on the industry uh -huh. uh, of course there is a, there is many things details in technologies and, and, and management that uh, I, I, I I have to skip uh -huh. I, I, unfortunately, for in one and a half hours, it, it's not possible to go into much details. Uh -huh. uh, but at least to give your students a, a sense of how is the situation, okay, how, how the industry actually boosts the agriculture in the world. Uh -huh. in terms of <clears throat> Please check your mic. Thomas, please check your mic. Yeah. Uh, why, why, why is uh, meeting automatically? Somebody wa mutes me. <laughs> no, really? not much. <laughs> How come? It's not, I, I, I didn't move my hands. Is it? Okay. Yes. Oh. That's strange. Really, really. Yeah, okay. So I'm, what I'm saying is that, um, the idea is to show your students how, how much the industry has been helping developing the, 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 the agriculture business, uh, turning 
it from local consumptions, local di distributions to worldwide companies and, and multinationals. Mm -hmm. um, and how much actually, uh, how, how much money could be invested in, 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 in this business? I mean, it's a lot. So uh, the investment there is, uh, yeah, I, I think now is in billions. Mm. Uh, on, on, and, and mostly in new technologies, and that, that, that's important. Um, I think that the, the industry has has been helping a lot on, on that. So that's going to be like a process of the of the of the of the talk. Of course, the last part is going to be more focused on genetics, which is my field of expertise. Mm. Um, trying to show you what what they are doing, what we are doing, uh, how it's done, and uh, just some conclusion at the end. Yeah, of course, yeah. I think the most interesting part is going to be the questions Q and A, questions and answers, uh, to, to try to, in my, in my best, try to, to uh, fill the gaps or and answer what, what your students yeah, are interested in. So, I think that will, be, that will be great interaction after your uh, talk on these expert areas. So if, uh, if you, uh, ha, I think oh, Dr. Kumar, are... you initiate that. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to our honorable speaker, uh, Dr. Thomas. And uh, as you all know, that uh, Central Institute of Fisheries Education is aiming to become a center of excellence in inland saline aquaculture through cutting edge research under the aegis of National Agriculture Higher Education Project, which is a World Bank funded project. And as a part of one of the activities of this program, we have been conducting different lectures by eminent personalities for the benefit of students, staff, faculty members, and for the benefit of entire fisheries sector. So uh, today we are organizing the 17th distinguished lecture by one of the eminent speaker, that is Dr. Thomas Gitterle. And, uh, he will be talking on role and uh, role and contribution of industry in the growth of aquaculture. So, without taking much time, now I invite our honourable director and vice chancellor, Dr. Gopal Krishna, to uh, brief about the NAHEP and also to introduce our honourable speaker. So, please. Dear Dr. Bhusharma, dear, uh, first of all, I would like to. Welcome each one of you, Dr. Thomas Gitterle, who is the main speaker of today's program. My colleagues, Dr. Sahu, Joint Director, Head of the Divisions, faculty members, students and friends. Before I would like to introduce Dr. Thomas Gitterle to the audience, I would just like to tell him that uh, Dr. Thomas, uh, this Central Institute of Fisheries Education, you are already well aware of that we are a deemed university under Indian Council of Agriculture Research. And we are offering master's and doctoral program in fisheries science. Uh, they, we are offering these courses in 11 disciplines of fisheries science. They are aquaculture, fisheries resource management, post harvest technology, fish genetics and biotechnology, nutrition and uh, feed technology, and uh, fisheries extension, fisheries economics, like that there are 11 disciplines. And we are admitting almost 100 students at master's level and 60 students at doctoral level. So this is the strength at a given point of time, we are having uh, roughly around 275 to 300 students at our campus. You have visited this institute earlier, I remember that. So you have a fair idea that how and why we are doing all these things. And uh, one colleague of uh, ours, Dr. Jagirdar, who is also always in touch with you and other uh, experts in the area of genetics, quantitative genetics and fish genetics. So we are always in a uh, contemporary group, moving on different aspects. I thought that your experience, which I would like to tell my, colleagues that Dr. Thomas, uh, who is the 
ब्रीडिंग एंड जेनेटिक्स डायरेक्टर साई एक्वा ग्रुप एंड रीगल स्प्रिंग तिलेपिया ही इज ए सीनियर साइंटिस्ट विद मोर देन ट्वेंटी ईयर्स ऑफ एक्सपीरियंस वर्किंग विद जेनेटिक इंप्रूवमेंट प्रोग्राम्स इन एक्वेटिक स्पीशीज ही हैज बीन एसोसिएटेड विद सिवरल रिसर्च एंड ब्रीडिंग कंपनीज डॉक्टर थॉमस गिटरले वॉज द डायरेक्टर ऑफ द जेनेटिक डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ सिन एक्वा इन कोलम्बिया फ्राम टू थाउजेंड फाइव टू टू थाउजेंड इलेवन फ्राम टू थाउजेंड सिक्स टू इलेवन ही वॉज ऑल्सो ए सीनियर साइंटिफिक एडवाइजर एट एक्वा फोर्स जेनेटिक सेंटर इन नॉर्वे वेयर ही एडवाइज ऑन द ब्रीडिंग प्रोग्राम्स ऑफ मेनी एक्वेटिक स्पीशीज इन बेल्जी इक्वेडोर इंडिया एंड थाईलैंड इन थाईलैंड इन टू थाउजेंड इलेवन गिटरले मूव टू थाईलैंड टू हेड द ब्रीडिंग प्रोग्राम ऑफ साई एक्वा ग्रुप along with his continued work for sai aqua group in florida he is the breeding and genetic director at regal spring tilapia gitterle served on the scientific committee of the international association of genetics and aquaculture from 2006 to 2011 over the course of his career dr gitterle has ap <coughs> always applied advanced technologies to quantitative genetics and genomic selection which is his expertise one of his special interest in the development of new ways to accurately select for disease resistance gitterle is the author of more than 20 scientific articles in index journals and two books of chapters he has also been a special guest speaker at over 50 international symposia dr gitterle received his bachelor's degree in marine biology and a doctoral degree in selective breeding in aquatic species from the university of life science in norway so this is a brief introduction of dr gitterle other than that i have personal discussion with him we were together in norway for almost uh, more than two months together and he was there for more than number of years and uh, he is a very good friend of mine we keep interacting with each other we know that how the things develop and using the scientific knowledge for the development of business and entrepreneurs and for the betterment of the cause of the people who are making the efforts to get the uh, nutrition to be given to all so that is something very very different and what i am very sure about is that with his scientific strong background and his field of work as a entrepreneur and as giving the technology to those who wants to use them for the benefit this is a rare combination so i thought that our students and faculty members will get the advantage of his knowledge dr gitterle uh, we are running a project which is world bank funded project uh, it is on national it is national agricultural higher education project and in this we are targeting to develop and transform the technology energy efficient technology for the uh inland saline ground water where we are we have given the technology of developing the economy so that is the objective and with that we want that there should not be environmental degradation the technology should be economically beneficial to the farmers who are taking it up and further to that we want that this technology and the industry will come together and so that academia and industry grow together so that is the objective so with this brief introduction of the project what we are having then the students who are here and the faculty members who are here they would like to listen from you that how you have applied the scientific knowledge for the development of the industry and how it is growing because that is the sunrise sector and we can transform the areas which are not suitable for aquaculture because this uh, because the waters are not that good as far as the aquaculture is concerned we want to develop these species we want to develop these strain so that that becomes beneficial to the farmers so i would like that you please throw light on these areas and the topic which has been given to you uh, you may uh, go here and there keeping in mind that they are masters and doctoral students they are the faculty members and they will be very happy to listen to you and maybe after that would like to interact with you on certain points so welcome again and would like to give you the mic so that you carry on 
your deliberation. Thank you and welcome Dr. Thomas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Goffel, for the nice words. Um, it's, of course, uh, certain that uh, we have had a long story together and a good friendship, but also not only that, but a, a very success, uh, I think, careers in our fields. Um, we, we, with our interactions with other institutions, have been able to... We, we have been able to actually um, make many things for the industry, not only <clears throat> in terms of uh, economic, but also on research and helping others to be successful. And that's, that's probably what is most important in, in, in this field. Um, thank you very much for this invitation. I am honored to present this talk, or give this lecture to, to your students and your staff. I know that this uh, group of people is very high educated and uh, I hope that they don't get disappointed with, with the talk uh, because I want to cover a lot of topics uh, and uh, focus only on genetics deeply. Um, but I think it's important also to everyone to start knowing what, what is um, there is more of the scientific topic. Uh, okay. I, there is somebody talking. <laughs> okay. Um, um, it's important that uh, for some of the history and what have been the, the most contributions and towards what areas is the industry going. That's I think to me it's important because towards we need to, to focus the research uh, on what the industry is needing, on the needs of the industry. And that's important for, for, for researchers and students and uh, universities is to really focus the research, not only for publications, because sometimes, and then I, I is, a, is a constructive critics, sometimes universities focus more on the paper and the, then rather than doing some complete research that could be used by the industry. That is something that, as Gopal, Dr. Gopal says, it's very important to make this match and, uh, and, and help the development on the agriculture in general. <clears throat> okay. Uh, thank you for all the people that uh, are listening. And, 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 and uh, uh, please, after the, this presentation, do, do not hesitate to, to make all the questions you could, I'm going to try my best to answer them. Um, probably not all, but uh, I hope that I could answer some of them. <laughs> so I, I want to now to share my screen. Let me know if, uh, oh, sure. do you see it? Yes. All right. Okay. Um, I'm going to this. Okay. Um, okay. The, 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 as, as Dr. Kopa said, the, the lecture is going to be on the role and contribution of the industry in the growth of the aquaculture. Um, I got just all the lecture content. Uh, uh, I'm going to go through a very, very deep. Uh, fast on the aquaculture stages. Cap capture versus aquaculture, I think that's important that we could talk about, about the transition, offer and demand of the volumes on, on, on um, uh, aquaculture uh, uh, products, investment and the big job when we start really producing uh, to, to feel the demand that the capture is not is not uh, doing research and development to meet demand. I think we are going to. I'm going to talk about husbandry, health, feed, and the seed. And when I talk the seed, I talk about not only the hatchery technologies and husbandry, but the genetics, the supply chain. I think is important for the industry to have a complete supply chain and variable supply chain, supply chain uh, from the eggs to, the, to your table and new technologies in feed husbandry and genetics.
Okay, you, you probably know that much better than I. Uh, agriculture started a uh, long time ago, and it, it, most was, it mostly was to supply local markets, right? Um, it was only until probably last century where agriculture started to be industrialized, industrialized, industrialized and, and be part of the, of the business and the, of the supply chain of the world. And this is just a picture telling you that we are not in a business, it's a new business. This has been a business or activity that has long, long history, uh, 3, 000, uh, probably 4,000 years. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's, it's important that you know that we, we and in Asia, for instance, was part of very important part of the development of culture. Uh, there is some uh, um, milestones here that are important to, to, to to know, and then it's, it's when Europe start to, to see aquaculture as a possible source of protein. And Asia has known that long time ago, and we learned, I think Europe learned from Asia about the possibility to culture fishes. The recent story, the history is just a breakthrough and, 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 and milestones. And I think I'm going to focus on the on, on the development on the since the last century. Um, I think in, in nine, 1924, was well, the first cultivated plants uh, in tilapia. Tilapia was well, the first tilapia that is now one of the most important uh, fresh fish. Well, was just recently, not very long time ago, cultivated. It was only probably 100 years ago, where we start really farming tilapia, and was, of course, in, 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 in Africa. Um, then the, we, the culture started to, to, to see we got growing oysters, and then success to have the first crop. And then we make a big jump in 1950 with the plastic. Uh, you know that before, Farming in the sea was very complicated because there is nothing that could stand the rust from sea environment. And the plastic actually gave us, and I don't like the plastic as environmental part, but I, I, I do appreciate that with the plastic, we could actually solve many of the big problems in the industry where we could actually um, make nets and cages and, 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 and uh, farming um, procedures and, and husbandry that um, allow us to, to fish and develop um, and to culture the fishes in the sea without having rusting problems. <clears throat> in, in 1954, we developed the first moist feed for fish, and uh, that's a very big breakthrough because before that uh, was even not. We, we didn't feed the fishes, or there was just uh, um, uh, giving very uh, easy or and 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 and, and uh, not dignified feeds that, of course, uh, make that culture was not really efficient. But with the development of moisture feeds uh, and specific feeds for fish and aquaculture, uh, we could start having a much better crops and be much more efficient. In, in 1958, were the first 10 kilograms of shrimps big enough to be marketable, that was in Japan, with the new Japonicus. Uh, and in actually, in, in 1959, the first cages of salmon was uh, floating cages made by wood, uh, and they were the first crop on, on, on farm salmon in, in, in the world. And um, then, then we start when that, that is important because at that moment, actually people start realizing that agriculture could be a business, not only something to provide protein for local families or local markets, but really a big, big business. Then technologies for, for farming uh, uh, oysters, um, so salmon farm started in 1970. In 1971, it was the first first 
family based breeding program in Salmon that was in Norway. Uh, what was now now is well developed what now is known as Nofima Marine. Uh, and, that, and that actually helped a lot the salmon industry to become what is now uh, a huge industry is is really how they, they could uh, start having a better fish and with the new technology and feeding in, in feed, feed development, they could uh, actually start the, the, the salmon farming in, in an industrial scale. Uh, because I just, I, I'm going to talk afterwards, if, if the demand is there, but the supply of raw material of fish is not there, we cannot make a business. But the fish needs to have reliable supply of fingerlings and feet. Without these two things, it was impossible to make a business. So the feet and the hatchery technologies were two main things or important things that now we see it very common. But that was the two main supplies that makes agriculture to be a big business. Uh, then in 1980, we start or they start the first uh, development on the RAS system, uh, aquaculture um, uh, resolution systems. Um, and that's also a, a very important development because that, that actually allow different uh, countries and and and, um, and technologies to go into uh, where where water supply was is limited. So even when with limited water supply, you have rust systems, you could have a very good crops in aquaculture right now. In 1985, probably you already know, started the tilapia gift project, where the aim was to. Uh, mimic and uh, try to do the same as what's done in Salmon in the 70s to have a level uh, seed supply that are genetically superior that could help the farmers to have better crops and better and better incomes. That was done for again uh, a way to help farmers, or small farmers, but at the end uh, it helps more to develop tilapia as a big industry and, 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 and project. Um, 1994, this is another very important uh, milestone is that they could close the cycles from Pinus Vaname. Uh, that means that before that, all the seed produced for the big ponds in, in South America was done with wild rootstocks. That the same thing that was done in, in modern until recent years in India and in Asia. Was done, was done in with Vaname in the, 19, in the 1990s when they could actually close the cycles and start a real family based breeding program. Uh, that also was a big, big, big change in the shrimp industry. It was so big that actually Vaname, Vaname is now uh, the, the prominent species in, in, in shrimp aquaculture. I think it's maybe 90, 85% of the total uh, shrimp culture is vanilla. Now, uh, in, 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 in this century, we start uh, getting some new technologies and it's more on, on, on farming and how could we monitor the farms better and make it more efficient with the feed, feeding, with the feeds and the feeding regimen, yeah? Um, they were acoustic telemetry to, to measure the fish behavior, for instance, where you can identify each fish and actually feed the animals they fish the, 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 uh, feed the fishes based on their real demand and needs. Uh, you start using uh, artificial intelligence uh, as a tool of, of, of feeding the animals. Um, now in, 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 in Salmon, these huge self-propelled farms that go into the sea, in the, in the, in the ocean, uh, where you could have less impact on environment and less, uh, of course, uh, uh, effects of diseases. 
and then we start also with the with the inland these inland uh, salmon projects. Uh, the changes were a big breakthrough, uh, but now salmon industry realized that uh, there is a many factors they cannot control in the cages and the sea. Uh, they are exposed to all environmental uh, effects, not only uh, the, the, the climate, but also the diseases. So they are, the, the, the trend in salmon is not going to be inland, to go to inland. For that, that, that needs a lot of investments and technologies to be able to produce salmon inland and at the same, at the same volumes, because again, you could produce a lot of things inland with a, in a small scale, but we are talking about the scale of salmon production, which is maybe one million tons per year, so uh, or even more. So um, imagine that produced in the inland. So you need to have a very, very well-established and efficient uh, RAS systems and, and technologies to control temperature, temperature salinity. <coughs> And also all the feeding, right? Um, now, in 2020, the goal is again is uh, monitoring and working more towards the individual needs of the fishes, not seeing the 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 the, the, the culture as a whole cage, but individual animals. Then you can monitor each animals every time and see if the animals is growing as we expect, or if not, start to cooling those animals that will not meet your needs. And you can start saving a lot of money and, and, and reject animals that won't be successful or produce what you need before the harvest. So you don't spend feed and time on animals that are not going to be productive. So this is the, 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 the time line in the breakthroughs in the last century that actually helped the industry being what is right now. Okay, let's let's talk about this. I'm going to spend uh, some time talking about the difference of, of, of the evolution in the capture compared with the aquaculture. Um, we see a in, in capture, we see a big improvement from 1950 to 1970s. Uh, it were the transition from the steam boats to the diesel boats. That was one of the reasons. It's technology again. All the, unfortunately, the wars are horrible, but, but they give us, or they bring us a lot of technology to the civil world, <laughs> to us as, as a, a consumer. So all these ships, that was made for the Second World War. This technology actually helped the fishing industry to have more efficient boats and start fishing in a better, in a, in a, in a more industrial way. So the big jump uh, from the 1950 to 1970s actually was uh, based on, on, on better boats and, 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 and more efficient uh, fuel, fuel use. And we have to bear in mind that the, the gas and oil at that time was very cheap. And of course, that it, it, it boost the construction and the use of fishing boats. Now what happened? The energy crisis in the 1970s. So where you have this big crisis and, 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 and gas and, and energy became very expensive compared with what we asked. So it could be one reason of this flatten in the in the in the capture during those years. Uh, of course, not only because the boats or the fishing was more expensive um, and profits were less, but also in, in general the growing the middle class growing population in the states and you know, Europe and the world start having economic problems, right? So they were not and and, and you you might not feel that in India, but uh, in, in Europe, in, 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 uh, in the States, fish products are a little bit more of a luxury, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, it's an expensive food. So if you have less income, you try to use or to eat chicken or other things uh, besides uh, that could 
they are less expensive. And that could be another reason of this flattening. The game is starting, it started uh, growing again with new technologies like Aero, Gecko Radar. So the new boats start to implement a lot of new technologies to be more efficient in the capture. And that increases a lot the capture again. Aquaculture, you see very low, very small growth compared with, 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 with the capture. But the good thing of the capture is that they created the demand. You know, when you have a lot of supply to the people and you have, you create that needs of eating aquaculture products, fishes and, 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 and crustaceans and shrimps, then people get used to get those uh, products. And, and the capture and, and, and the efficient capture that reduces the prices to the end consumer create the demand. And that helps agriculture to grow without demand. There is no uh, product. I mean, there is not the need of, of having the product. But the capture actually creates the demand. And what happened with the capture? It flattens a lot the last 30 years. It hasn't, it hasn't been grown. It's steady. And it, you have heard about the uh, catch uh, per unit, uh, the, uh, the effort, the, the catch per unit effort, which is how much vessels or how much time or how much effort you need to cut to catch or capture one ton of fish. So, because all these new techniques, te technologies, uh, there was a lot of fish going there, uh, fishing boats going there. And now they are having started depleting actually the seas. And now, now they are they need more effort to catch the same amount of fish. Okay, so that is a that is a problem with the with the capture. Uh, uh, they have to be more in the future, much more um, um, sustainable. And there is a lot of work toward that area. But this uh, reduced in or or steady. Volume of the capture um, give the room to aquaculture to grow. Why? Because the demand continues to grow, and that's that's very important. When the demand continues to grow, but the capture could not fill that gap, is where aquaculture came and and became a business, right? And then is and, and for just. Uh, uh, Going, I'm going to give you some, some uh, breakthrough on that. I already talked about this, but the first thing that we start getting in agriculture and why we could uh, become a big industry is about the, 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 these three, three main things, commercial feeds, sea cages, and commercial fingerlings and seeds. I think there are the three things that makes agriculture becoming a big industry. And that's why we could start growing from 1919 toward until today, right? In, 19, in 2010 is where most of the species or big commercial species start using selective, selective breeding in their operation or in the industry. Before uh, this century, very little uh, species were Produced based on real, um, uh, um, well, well managed and well designed breeding programs. It was only until 2010 when, when the industry realized that without safety breeding or good genetics, it was not possible to grow uh, or continue growing. And this is where we start using, on the UC in 2010, where most of the species that are. Grown has been actually uh, implemented uh, specific and well designed breeding program. At that time, also, the, the people realized, and that is again uh, a pressure of, of the fish, of fishing um, uh, or, or, or marine species being depleted, is that the fish meal and fish oil start to be very expensive and not affordable and also a bit very. Um, um, unstable qualities is where the feed companies and the industry start 
looking for alternatives to replace fish meal and fish oil. Um, and then he started to, to, to start with the uh, vegetable proteins, in some cases successful, in some cases not much. Uh, and now we are looking, or the, the feed industry is looking for more um, reliable and, and uh, high quality fish uh, protein, I mean, uh, animal protein with insects or even the rinders uh, could be a good alternative. And I'm going to talk a little bit about, about that in the, in the future, uh, more in the, in the presentation. But yes, fish uh, um, uh, agriculture feed industry is now looking for better alternatives for, for uh, ingredients, um, more towards specific amino acids and, and, and soya, so, uh, specific uh, um, uh, components that are having better nutrition and less anti-nutritional effects into the animal. So that's, that's also boost a little bit the, the production from 2010 to 2020. Uh, and then just a, a big overall, and I think the, 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 the inflection point uh, when, when aquaculture took over or started being more important than the capture was in 1990. And I think, and then of course I could be biased because I'm a genetist, but I think the main breakthrough was because the, 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 the implementation of very specific breeding programs. When you have a, a, a very a good seed and a four, I mean, when you have a, a um, supply, a constant supply of good quality seed, is I think that was the main reason when aquaculture really starts off. Because for for us as industry, and I told you about my personal case and all the industry I've been working, the worst thing you could have or is having your ponds or cages empty because you don't have the seed to start. That's a, that is the worst thing you could have. Of course, you could have problem with the feed, but you could have alternatives, but you don't have the seed to start. I mean, there is no, no point, no industry without the seed. Okay, so closing cycles, reproduction is probably was the first or the most important um, breakthrough or, or success to make agriculture uh, at the industry we have right now. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's talk a little bit of supply and demand, and that is also a play uh, um, a thing that that is very important. Why agriculture grew and growing still so high? You see, I probably have seen these these, these charts before where of course you have uh, a higher supply and the lower demand, you have a lower uh, uh, prices where your demand increases and your supply decreases also, you have a short shortage or when your supply increases and your demand decreases, you have a surplus. So the, the, the equilibrium is where you hide the prices and every product tends to, to toward the equilibrium, where the supply and the demand are most the same. When this, the demand starts, and then, then this equilibrium could change. The equilibrium changes when the demand starts steady to be higher than the supply, and then you get a new equilibrium point, right? But because the supply should always try to, to meet the demand. Some ways, you, this, this point of, of um, um, equilibrium could change toward the years, but normally it tends that the, I mean, in every product, in every industry, the supply tends to reach the demand. When the supply starts to be higher than demand, nobody wins <laughs> because the prices start to going down, right? And then nobody wants that. But in agriculture, and that is interesting, the prices have been going up in general in this century. Uh, that gives us a good view of the demand. The demand is, the demand. The demand 
is in general always being a little bit higher than the supply, right? Otherwise, the, the price will be uh, steady. But this is a fish index. It's not in, in prices because, of course, you said, okay, um, 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 there is an inflation point here. Of course, in general, everything is going to be more expensive. No, but this index used by FAO is, in general, based on um, um, prices without taking into account the inflation. And now, as one other important thing, when the money, when, when, when the prices are going up and, and aquaculture is going, tends to be interesting, and people see that in the industry, I'm not talking about small farming, but the industry and the big investments, portfolios, which is also important to, to, to talk about it, and uh, investments, uh, portfolios that they are always looking for new opportunities, when they see that something could be interesting in terms of profit, the money is there. I tell you very, very, very clear. Now, the portfolios are looking for many possible projects in, 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 to supply the, the feed demand in general. So they are looking for new projects, they are looking for new opportunities. And when, when they see a good opportunity, the money is there, right? Because they are looking for that. So you, you, if, you, if, you, if you, as a aquaculturist or investor, or, or, or you have a good idea in your research, and you could sell that, and you could prove that that may have some profit, the money, for sure, you're going to get money. money people, this kind of money is always there looking for new projects. And that actually helps a lot. And this game. One thing that boosts our culture. I say, hey, I, I want to fulfill the demand, you know? And my, 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 boat, my fishing boats are not filling up my, my processing plants. I invest a lot in processing, but now my fishing boats are not in my capacity, my installed capacity, right? I have a lot of uh, installed capacity, but my fishing boats are always taking more time to, to, to bring me the feed, the, the fishes. So I need to have a steady and reliable supply from the raw material. And that's why these people that and in agriculture started with the main, with, with the same companies, most of the companies they have processing plants that have been supplied by, by the, the capture and fishing vessels, they start thinking on having their own production. Because again, if for us as farmers, the worst thing is not to have the seed or the processing plant, the worst thing that they have, they can have face is not having the raw material for processing. The same problem. You can you just spend a lot of money in people and energy, but you don't have anything to process, you are losing money. Okay? So they start investing money in farming. In general, shrimps, uh, salmon, tilapia, whatever they need to, to, to fill up the, the, the process, right? But these uh, big cages or big farms need to, to be filled up again. I think, again, they said, okay, I need, I, I want to produce uh, salmon, shrimps to my product, and I build the farm, but I have to fill up the farm again. I need to have the hatcheries to supply, big hatcheries, and the dedicated feed mills for aquaculture. And that's also a very important thing. Before, most of the, the, the feed companies in the in last century, they, 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 have, they, they produce a lot of feed for poultry, for pigs, for dairy cattle, and they have a small part for aquaculture, which was in general the same formulation with a little changes, uh, but not very much uh, research on that. The big changes was when these big companies start producing big amount of fishes and shrimps. Okay, now this feed didn't work anymore. We need to make a specific feed that meets the requirements of each of the species we are working with, right? We cannot work with the poultry feed anymore. We cannot and, and, and just change a little bit of things. We have to have a lot 
uh, a new product. And this is where all the research in the universities, in the research institutes came to work together in developing feeds specific for shrimps or for tilapia or for, or for salmon, but not, uh, not any feed. You need to have a feed first that could meet the requirements of the species you are working with, but also that could be profitable for the feed company, right? So that is a, that, that is an antagonist uh, 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 expression because the feed wants to have a good feed, but not investing a lot in raw material. I tell you because uh, I work I worked before with feed, feed, feed companies, and they is 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 a, is a daily uh, um, fight between quality and raw material price. That is the, that that is the game, the big game of the feed mills is keeping the quality, but playing with the raw material price. That is, so uh, replacing a little bit of deal with that and that you keep the quality and the formulation requirements, but that I can say. I, have, I was muted. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, 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 continue, please. Okay. All right. So uh, that is for the for the fees. I mean, they, 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 uh, these big companies need to have a very good fit. So they create that in that way. They they started producing their own fees, but they realized that was not so easy. So feed companies like Car Grill, uh, CP. Uh, uh, Thai Union, all these big feed companies saw the agriculture uh, feed as a big opportunity to invest and they create dedicated meals for that. And they, they, they are very successful, successful because actually there is a big difference between the, the, the agriculture feeds and the livestock feeds. The livestock feeds is a, is a recipe, everyone can do it. In, for agriculture, there's still a little bit of magic. You know, there is still uh, some differences in the quality and the performance between different um, uh, brands and different kinds of feeds. And you don't have, you cannot use the same size of feeds for every stage. You have to have different uh, uh, feed, at least feed sizes. And now, actually, they are starting to have different feed formulations depending on the size and age of each of the species we're working. So they are more specialized feeds uh, than uh, in aquaculture than in livestock. And the main reason, and one, uh, the, the main and obvious reasons, is because we are working with a wet environment. I mean, have, the feed that we produce in, in aquaculture has to be stable in the water and keep the nutritional factors in the water. That is a big change. I mean, imagine a guy uh, or, or, or the industry that was being used uh, or producing a, a feed for, for poultry that they have, they need to produce feed for shrimps or for, or, for, or for tilapia or for salmon. The first thing they have to solve is how I can keep the nutrients in the water. So that is a big, that was, that was a big area of research. It, 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 looks, it looks very simple right now. And very obvious, but it wasn't at that time. So uh, you had to imagine all these people thinking how we are going to do that and everything. Okay. So the same what happened with the with the with the fish meals happened with the hatcheries. So I used to produce I knew with 1,000 animals per month, and now the demand was of billions, millions of millions of fingerlings per month. So how could we scale that? In a short time, and that to me was one of the of the of the bottlenecks was having enough fingerlings to start, and people have been investing in, in a lot in, in hatcheries, uh, in 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 grass systems, indoor systems because of course fingerlings are are, are are more susceptible and 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 more delicate than the grown animal, so you need to have very clean, very good systems to produce the fingerlings.
trying to avoid uh, pathogens and bacteria, giving very good feeds. Again, feeding, <laughs> feeding the, the, the fingerling. Nobody know, knew how to feed a fingerling. So they start with algae, with small things, and then they, they, they develop specific feeds. But I want to, to talk a little bit more on that afterwards. But this is a big thing, okay. In, 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 in general, or, or, or making a resume, when the, 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 the fishing companies started to uh, fulfill their gaps in production or in, in processing with agriculture, they realized that it was not so simple. They have a complete network they have to develop. And that is where the big money came from. And that is, that is what, what, what Next one, okay. These big companies came to the game, right? These companies came with big amount of money. Now, big amount of money makes changes because this is not a, uh, on from the agriculture. If you want to do it in a big scale, it's not, it's not done, it's not possible to do it with small amount of money. You need to invest. And we need to invest big, big amount of money. So that was this very integrated companies, Pescanova, BMR, CP, Marine Harvest, Union, Regal Spring, came and made all these big investments to close cycles and to, and to, and to integrate uh, agriculture into our own business. Okay. What time is it? Um, from the eggs to your table, when, when we are in a restaurant and we see these things, we never thought on or the production chain. Uh, what, what, what has been done or what was needed? I to have the salmon in my plate, the tilapia filet or the shrimps. So it's, 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 it's a long chain of supplies and, 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 and work. So it's, it's probably the, the, the people that are in front of the table, they don't appreciate so much, so all the work done uh, for him to have or to enjoy his place. So I want to tell you a little bit of that. You know very well, but I think it's important to, 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 to be sure and, and the scale we're talking about, it's not so simple. Okay. Let's start with the raw material. And I'm going to be the example of a figure of, 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 of uh, Regal Spring. When you have a raw material, you have a fish, and it's perfectly uh, uh, possible that you want to oh. supply to oh. the other markets. And, and that, that is, there are companies that are now focusing on supply local markets. So where they do not need to process, or the process is very simple, they, they, they sell the entire animal to the local markets. And instead of having a complete chain of production, they are focusing on supply local markets, and lock, uh, but not only one farm, but several farms strategically um, build in areas where very high demand from local people. And one company could be as big as Regal Spring, just supplying local markets. That is a possibility. And actually probably more profitable than having the whole uh, uh, chain in their hands. Because when you only grow your animal, you supply to local markets, probably lower prices, but you don't have produce, uh, processing costs, probably your most profitable. On the other hand, you have the these big companies like, like Regal Spring, where you have the complete cycle, you have the whole uh, integrated cycle uh, from the genetics until the, 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 the end consumers. Uh, and it's here where, where you have the main headaches in supply chain. Because when you talk about huge volumes, every single penny or 1% in each of the variables is a lot of money. If you save 
1.1% in FCR, increase uh, your fit efficiency in 1%, I'm talking about millions of dollars per year. And, and, and sometimes we don't rely on the researcher that, okay, 1% is nothing. So I'm very, I, I, I increase my, uh, uh, decrease my FCR in, in 1%. And to me, it was not a big success when you when you do the research in, in, in the university. Uh, this feed reduces, or this the feed reduces, or my Hallman Dream method reduces one percent the FCR, or the genetics reduce one percent the FCR. To me, it was not a big success. But if you transfer this one percent in ninety thousand tons per year, is a lot of money. Believe me. So. That are the changes and the things that we have to think about it as research is every small change at that scale is important, right? So the logistics, just regal swing, not other companies that are probably bigger than us, but we produce 90,000 tons per year, right? In one farm, this is the, the whole company, in one farm in, let's see, Indonesia, we have to harvest 80 tons per day. Imagine harvesting 80 tons per day. You need trucks, you need people, you need the quality of the animal. The animal needs to be reach alive to the processing plant, from the lake to the processing plant. Uh, for instance, in, in Indonesia, it's a three or four hours truck journey where the animals have to be alive in water tanks, three hours, driving into the mountains in Indonesia to reach the processing plant, right? So the big logistics is oxygen, is people, is quality, you know, it's, it's everything, you know? And, and every part of this is a chain in production that could be always improved, right? It's a lot of research. <laughs> for when you took up a culture, people are talking about okay, how I farm, how I do feed it, and genetics. But when you talk about the industry of culture, it's much more than this. I and mean, the industry is logistics, is transportation, is how to keep the animal alive in good quality. The meat has to be good quality at the end because a company like Regal Springs they sell to very high quality or standards qualities. So an animal that get damaged during transport, we cannot sell that animal anymore. So these kind of, of, of activities and, and research and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, production has also to be or taken into account in, in the research in the future. Again, you, you can have a produce very good feed, but you have to deliver 130 tons of feed every day. And how you do that? With boats, then with auto, auto feeders, uh, you have to keep the, 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 the feeding good quality, you have to store it correctly, <coughs> you have to deliver it correctly, and you have to deliver it in some way you, you make profits and you don't harm the ferment, right? So the feeding, only the feed has to be a good, uh, has to be very good in quality, but the, how you deliver your feed is very important right now. It's, it's delivering and feeding technologies. That's it is becoming more and more important in the industry because even though you could have a very good quality feed, if you deliver them wrongly, you are you are, you are not going to have good success, right? Thermo seed and fingering the seed again. We need to produce a drop of one hundred twenty thousand fingerings per day. Imagine that, we have to produce 120,000 fingers per day. That's a huge operation, right? Not only having the eggs or the fingerling alive, you have to transport them alive. And, you, and, and, and they have to reach the cages in good conditions, otherwise they will die. And 1% 1 of 120 animals dying per day, it's a lot, it's a lot of animals, right? It's a lot of money. So again, at that scale, every single percentage is important, okay? Then you have to operate the farm. You need boats, staff, day and night, feeders, energy, how you supply the energy to the lakes. I mean, there's a big operation. There's a lot of things around 
aquaculture that probably we are not thinking about, but is there and is needed. And research, and probably very little research is done in that kind of operations that is needed as well. En engineering, uh, uh, suppliers, it's, a lot, it's not only biological, but what we need is, is a lot of other things what we need in this industry to be there. And, and also a lot of research done. Because that the industry has in some way has has done that by themselves because they need it, not because they wanted to do it, it's because they need it. So a lot of research inside the companies to meet and uh, 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 solve all these issues. And and probably the academia could start looking at these things to help us to solve the problems, right? Okay. A little of research of development, I think probably about to talk a bit on, on the progress. Before, in, before the 1950, that was, is, that is how aquaculture looked. <laughs> Very simple. And still today, I have to say, more, many of the aquaculture that in developing countries looks like this. Because it's local farmers, yeah, you are looking, uh, and that is perfectly okay. I'm not criticizing at all. If that works and makes, give you, a, 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 brings you enough profits, it's perfect. Uh, but if you have seen, if you, if you see the development from salmon compared with the development of tilapia or shrimps, we are very far away, right? In technology. So from plants, uh, for instance, you're talking about tilapia. They, 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 we changed to cages in the lakes, like this. First, uh, that kind of cages, square cages, small ones. And now the tendency is big, round cages with, uh, with the boats and, and platforms where you keep the feet and uh, everything in the lakes. And this is the future for salmon and, and, and these complete integrated farms in uh, in open waters, far away from the coast, that are completely independent, like that. They are looking like an oil platform, but it's a it's a fish platform with a complete complete range or farm in the sea, deep in the sea. Right. That is about on, on, on cages. If you if we look at species like, like, like uh, tilapia and shrimps, the tendency is going from, from the urban ponds without erosion towards integrated, big uh, um, design farms, uh, more, more specific with aeration, with feed supply in, the, in, in, in each, in each uh, uh, pond, with uh, uh, a reservoir where you, you could treat your water uh, um, with channels to supply water and discharge uh, water, and people living actually besides the ponds. Then you could also actually start building your farm uh, more by secure, by adding uh, when, when liners or plastic liners in the pond to avoid uh, the interaction of pathogens from the soil. Uh, and then at the end, you have to move to more biosecure farms where you are completely covered or, or in uh, indoors farms. That is the tendency right now in, in the world. We're changing slowly because it's more, it's less expensive to build a complete new farm if you want to go indoors than trying to convert your existing farm in indoors. I mean, building a new thing is much less expensive than converting this farm in an indoor farm. So if the industry is still making profits with the, this kind of farms, which is the, the tendency is still the tendency in aquaculture in shrimps and tilapia and other species uh, besides salmon, um, they, they, they are not, going to, or easy to go towards indoor farming or mobile secure. Uh, the only way 
to force the, the industry to go more to more biosecure farming and, 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 and indoors farming with the recirculation or less water usage is if a big disaster, <laughs> I have, sorry to say that, but if a big disaster, disaster happens in that kind of farm. Uh, and when I talk about big disaster, it's mostly a big outbreak or disease, a pandemic disease. People thought that that was the case with, with uh, white spot and EMS happened. Um, uh, white spot, didn't change much the way of farming, but it does, sorry, it did. Uh, people start using more biosecure uh, uh, farming systems, meaning that they treated the water before stocking that, that actually killed the virus um, in the ponds. Um, so you could produce during 60 days without water change. I'm talking about shrimps, sorry. The white spot virus disease is a, is a disease that, that affects, if you, if, if, if you work in a clean environment, you're not get affected. Um, it's easy to get rid of it if you, if you got contaminated. I mean, you can clean your ponds, you can disinfect your ponds and you get rid of it. If you, if you disinfect and treat your, your water source, uh, it's not easy to get contaminated. Uh, you get contaminated with, with birds and other things, but normally that contamination um, or that infection it started after 60 days uh, post um, stocking. <clears throat> so the, um, the industry could manage white spot in a some way, in a good way, by keeping the biosecurity until, at least until the 60 days where they start uh, adding new water. If you could treat you, again, you could have, if you have water reservoir where you could treat the water and make the water change with real water, maybe you wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, get affected by wet spot. But if you don't have water, water reservoir, which is uh, a lot of cases in Asia, um, you, do, you, you could treat the water in the ponds before the stocking. So you, you fill up your ponds, you, you disinfect the ponds, um, um, and you stock your seed, but then when you make, you, you need to make water change after the 60 days, uh, you, 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 you enter raw, raw water and you enter, you enter the white, the, 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 the pathogen. In, in that cases, farmers need to have a very fast <coughs> animal that could be harvested at 60 days. That's why in Asia, uh, growth became so important rather than survival or robustness. In Thailand, in the, in the, I'm talking about Thailand, Indonesia, Vietnam, even South China, because they could manage small, small ponds with aeration and, bed and, and water treatment. So growth became very important because they needed to have a shrimps that could be harvested at a commercial size at 60 days. So if you, in Asia, if your seed do not grow up to 12 grams, 15 grams in 60 days, you, you probably would not have a good success selling your, your shrimps. Because even though the farm didn't get affected, the farmer do not like <laughs> to see a small animal at 60 days. Because at that moment, it could be contaminated anytime. So they, they are suffering from heart attacks. <laughs> If do not grow well. Okay, so that's why growth, uh, having a, a genetic that grow well in, in, in that kind of situation is very important. White spot, <coughs> white spot was solved in some way, but then it came up in EMS machine system where they, they, they get affected by uh, 30 days or four or, or 20 days. They, they, they just rip up all your farm in two days. They kill everything. The big difference between white spot and, and apple, which is a vibrio paramoliticus, is that vibrio, you can have get rid vibrio, get rid of the vibrio, clean the vibrio so easily. It all will be there. 
Vibrio, always be there. So cleaning bacteria, getting rid of bacteria, it's much more difficult than getting rid of the viruses, right? So when people realize that, they start moving from this to this, right? And that has been successful in the shrimp farms. But still, a lot of work to do. 90% of the farms are still like this or this, okay? Now, towards what should go this way or is going this way towards which area? I think, yes, as I said, it's going to full recirculating aquaculture systems um, to avoid pathogens. That is the main drive, what is the drive the industry to, to this kind of, of, of big investments is getting rid of pathogens. Imagine you have a salmon farm with 600,000 tons in the, in, in the sea in cages and comes a disease and kills 50%. I mean, you, all your profits or the investment profits from the last 10 years are gone in one season, in one. So um, people are thinking now in, in getting more secure or secure the production going inland and controlling pathogens. That is the main reason why people are, are trying to go inland is to control pathogens. Tilapia, again, uh, we, are, we, are, we, we suffer a lot in River Spring with diseases in the lakes, a lot. And, and, and conditions, and not only and, and, and low oxygen and everything. Even though we have a nice environment around, you are completely um, uh, affected and dependent on the water, of, of, the, of the climate and the conditions outside. So the industry, if they, if they want to be more stable, they need to go towards more control systems and that are rat systems even in shrimps you know it is the tendency to go to indoors to go to indoors it's a big investment but companies like cp are driving that they are they, 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 they are they, 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 they know that they want to survive again another another outbreak of pathogens they need to have that kind of production cp lost tons of millions of dollars with the EMS outbreak. They, 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 they learned. I am not, of course, CP is my competitor, but I have to say they are smart. They know what they are doing. And, and they know that they could not survive another outbreak like this. So they are changing all the farming system on all these farms to indoors and more control systems. <clears throat> all right, just a uh, little bit, uh, and the new technology on RAS, but it's RAS. So I, I, I'm not going to go through this very deeply because I think you know very well. You have your, 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 your fish tanks, that is for salmon. Uh, you have a drum filter to get rid of, uh, of, of the of measure of the, of the, uh, uh, of the sludge and then a, a mechanical filtration from separator, which is a, uh, get rid of the protein, then UV to, to kill the, the bacteria and viruses. Then you have your, your um, biological filter that turns uh, ammonia in the nitrates and nitrogen uh, in, 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 into uh, gasic nitri nitrogen, uh, get a uh, cell in tank to get all the sludge out, here to get all the sludge out, mechanical filtration, oxygen, if you need it. Sometimes in fish you need oxygen, uh, the detections, and biological filtration, right? That's a simple way to do it. You can add more things, but that is more or less what you need. Uh, skimmer, UV, uh, mechanical filtration, sludge elimination, and biological filters, right? That is for clean water. That is for fishes and whatever, that is important. In streams and in tilapia, there has been uh, exploring a new, new well, not only like this, this bioflux has been there for many years. It has been like a black cage for many years. People do not understand very well how it works. Uh, 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 they, they could manage. They, they've been a lot of research um, on small scale how, how to, to deal with it. 
And sometimes you have a very good flux system. Sometimes, even though you you you, you apply the same methodology, the flux that you get is not as bad, as good as you have, because you are dependent on the on the kind of bacteria community that is building up in your flux. So the flux, probably you know that better than I do. It's, it's, it's a system where in the production tank is building the bio, bio, bio filtration with nitrogen, nitrogen, nitrogen and nitrogen bacteria that turns the um, ammonia into gasic nitrogen, right? And then use their own, their, their own ways of food and feces to build this bacteria, this bacteria, bacteria community. You need to have a very strong aeration because you cannot have the points. And that probably has been the, the main issue in these systems is not having uh, uh, dead points uh, uh, where the sludge could, could sink and create anoxic, anoxic areas that actually build up pathogen bacteria. That is very, the most important thing in the flux systems is avoiding as much as possible dead points or uh, 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 sludge that could uh, grow, make grow uh, uh, vibrio and a pathogenic bacteria. If you have a good community, community of bacteria here where all are in equilibrium, then you don't have problems. You don't have uh, any issue with diseases. You can apply very high densities because the same flock is used as probiotics and as, as feed. Um, but you have to be very careful of the level of flux that you, 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 you want, you, you, you could keep in the systems. I, I, re I don't recommend more than 10 milliliters per, per liter of flux. When you start having more than 10, it starts building up very quickly afterwards and releasing it is very difficult. So always you need to have a sludge or a tank to reduce the flux, sedimentation, and when you're reaching, when your flux starts to reach 10, 8, 10, you need to start having a, a, a system to reduce the flux. You can do it, you can do it with, uh, <clears throat> with the sedimentation tanks, with skimmers, or protein skimmers, or there is some probiotics that actually very effectively reduce the flux in a very short time. So probiotics is also a key point in all these systems because probiotics is, is are first of all are competing with your with your um, um, pathogenic bacteria and actually, and actually are uh, uh, that is one way to avoid the use of uh, antibiotics. Okay, now on health, I already talked a bit about probiotics, but in health. The, the first thing that we need, the first measure of prevention diseases is barriers, pathogen exclusion. That is for sure the most effective way for keeping your stock healthy. The first thing is keeping your, uh, trying to keep your, your pathogen away. Do not keep the opportunity to kill your stocks. So that is a constant work in biosecurity. He sees the disinfection, uh, clean stocks, clean seed, clean tanks, clean water. That is the main, I mean, that is the first barrier. And this, I cannot stop telling people that that is very important. You cannot expect that your problems will be solved only because you have a genetic, good genetics good fit and uh, a good technician to grow your, your, your stuff. You need to start with a clean system. If you don't start with a clean systems, system, your chance of success drops a lot. And even, that's even true if you work in cages in the sea or the lakes. You need to start with clean cages, clean nets, clean animals, uh, and, 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 and good stored feed, because you could bring diseases with the feed, even if the feed is good, but if you don't store it correctly, start building up flavobacterium, and 
and a fungus that will kill your animals, right? So management of the feed, not only producing the feed, but management of the feed is very important. Otherwise, we will not succeed. In terms of advanced options, let's see that is given, but we have vaccination. Now it's, it's, it's a very, it's a tendency in Solomon and, 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 it, and it's, a, it's a tendency. It's a normal practice now in Solomon and in, 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 in tilapia to vaccinate. In Solomon for different bacterial diseases, already have diseases, they, they vaccinate the vaccines. For tilapia mostly is for Staphylococcus vaccines. Um, now we are working with a vaccine. And that again, the, the industry here has been doing a big job. And all these vaccines uh, companies, I looked at DSM, Merck, and, and, and uh, all these, a lot of uh, big um, pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical companies are now very interested in aquaculture. Because imagine, in one crop, one single stock you need to, to, to vaccinate like 50,000 animals, one cage. It's a lot of vaccines. So for them, agriculture became an, a very important um, prospect to in, in, increase their sales. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and they are working on that. Uh, so in some, in some, in some decisions, they are very successful, in some not so much. Um, now we are working with the trivalent uh, vaccines because we have different strains of streptococcus and uh, uh, serotypes, and uh, that is uh, that has been being a challenge for us because even though we could the the the, the, the fishes could build immune system the, the, uh, immunity for some serotype of the bacteria or uh, bacteria, so they are not for those. So we are now working with a trivalent uh, vaccine that it seems to be better. Uh, we are still in the research process, but as I tell you, we vaccinate every single animal we put in the cages. It's a big job, okay? Um, that is in fishes where you could have immune, immune memory. Unfortunately, with, with shrimps, we do not have that kind of uh, uh, advantage. So we cannot have vaccinations or is not possible to vaccinate in the same way we vaccinate the fish. There is, there is some options, and I, that is, I didn't put that here because it's a very controversial part, but you could work with double strain RNA in shrimps. I know you have been, uh, you heard about that. Double strain RNA from the same virus, virus that affects the animal, you create a double strain RNA from that virus, and the, that RNA destroys the virus, the, 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 the chain of DNA of the virus or RNA of the virus. It's very, it's, 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 it's very strange, uh, I tell you, very effective. I tried myself, no, not in me, but in my animals, and it works very well. You inject the animals or your shrimps with double strain RNA, and you infect with white spot, and they don't, they don't die. The problem with, with this technology, it do not remain for long. It remains for maybe 10 days. That, that um, protective um, um, capacity is 10 days, 15 days. Now the challenge, and that we have been working on that, and it's again, uh, a possibility that that, that, that that people should work on. The, 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 the challenge is to put this double strain RNA into the feed. So you could deliver the double strain, the double strain RNA constantly into your animal through the feed. And then you give the protection constantly in the feed, right? That, that, is, that, is, uh, that will be the, a game changer in the shrimp business. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to do that uh, without destroying and affecting the, the double strain chain. 
So uh, if you put heat or you put pressure in, the, in, in there, so you straight. So the point is how to do it without destroying the, 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 the feed there, right? Uh, there is some possibilities with coding and microencapsulation, and then just to give some ideas, you could use the same microencapsulation technologies that we're using in the hatch tree feeds to encapsulate the double strain array or coding, or or there is some way to code this double strain array with um proteins some kind of proteins are coding proteins that could actually cover the double string and then microencapsulation so we are in the process of there is some research on that there is some company that probably they are working on this right now uh, but very small research done so far so that is something that is could be very interesting and a game changer in the industry all right, probiotics. Uh, uh, probiotics has been one of the big improvements, or what, what is the of, of the of the area where it has been helping aquaculture a lot, a lot. Nowadays, nobody, or uh, in general, I cannot say nobody, but in general, we are using much less antibiotics. And not only because it sometimes doesn't work, but of course because the, all the environmental and entities and, and, and good practice entities avoid, uh, and, and even the governments actually uh, do not allow the use of antibiotics in agriculture because it's very harmful, it's dangerous, and, and, and not effective. I mean, that's why. And that has been changed, and, and, and uh, uh, antibiotics have been changed to probiotics. Um, and probiotics, not only in the feed, but, on, uh, but in, the, uh, in, 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 in the production tanks. <clears throat> in the feed works as, um, of, of course, it works uh, uh, to, to, in two, two ways, of course, reducing the amount of pathogens in the, in the intestine, in the, in the tra digestive tract, but also it helps also to absorb the feeds in a better way. It's like the yogurt for us, for you guys. You, you, yogurt is part of your life, I shall love it. And, and, and that is, best, is, is the best uh, um, example how it works so well in, 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 in the agriculture industry. I mean, uh, let, let, let's talk about yogurt, <laughs> in the problem is yogurt in, 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 in the shrimps and fish. It's, it helps you. It helps the animal a lot in, in the digest in digesting better the feed and of course prevention of uh, the harmful bacteria in the gut. But to me, they have a lot of controversy about the the, the effect, effectiveness of the of the probiotic in the feed because they said for instance shrimps, the feed pass so fast through the gut that it never, that the bacillus or, or, or the probability do not have the chance to even grow or have any effect. It goes past through the, the, the gut completely entire without even grow. So that is a possibility when the digestion hello. of... Hello? <laughs> When when you when 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 your fish or your 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 the animal you're working with, the time of the feed is very that pass through the the gut is very slow, then probiotic probably has a better effect compared with species where the digestion is very fast, right? Because they don't have the time, or, or the probiotic has not the time to have a good effect or, or, or the effect we want. Applying the probiotic in your production tanks is another, 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 another thing. It, in that case, it's much more effective <clears throat> because it remains there. 
it helps the sludge or, or, or to, to, to get rid of the sludge. It's, it digests the sludge, uh, a lot of them. It um, has, a, of course, um, competitions with harmful bacteria, so it's, it's like the flock. But if you put even good probiotics in your flock systems, it's even better because you boost and you create a flock with good bacteria. <clears throat> and that helps a lot. And actually, there is uh, uh, probiotics that actually are for the bottom of the tanks, probiotics that also for the water column, and actually probiotics that actually reduces the flux. So there's a lot in the, in the market, a lot of, pro of chances of using probiotics in your, in your, in your um, production systems, it's very specific for each system, and, and is there and available, and there are now big companies producing them, uh, offering them, so they are, uh, there's a lot of, probably too many <laughs> options there that, that you don't know really which one could help or not, but, uh, but they are, and, and they are uh, effective. The third group is immunostimulants, and that is a little bit more controversial again, because you could enhance the immune system of your animals, of course, but you cannot continue, you cannot do it in a continued way, because the animal, when, 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 when an animal actually activates their immune system, are using a lot of energy. You don't want your animal to use the energy that could use for growth, try to build the immune system all the time because you are telling them to do it, not because they have a real threat, it's because you are giving them in the immune stimulants that, that enhance the immune system. In some, some way, they, in some research have been done, it has been working or show good results, some of them less. So immunostimulants, to me, um, it's still uh, controversial. Uh, I do not use it. Uh, uh, I haven't seen much effect in that, but people still believe them, and they are, they are, they are in the market, there are many of them uh, that, that, that says that has good results in tissues. Uh, that is, uh, my, my experience with immune stimulants directly is not so much, so I cannot say much. But uh, in, 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 in the theory, if you see the theory, it could help. But I will be afraid of keeping an animal with the immune system activated all the time. Uh, it could harm the animal at the end and would, of course, affect an effect on, on growth. But that, that's something you guys have to do it uh, and test yourself. All right? Feed. What has been the change in the feed? I mean, that probably, again, I think you probably know more than me in that part. But of course, with, with, with pelletizing and extraction technologies, uh, so it was a game changer. And, and, and it makes uh, uh, companies or, 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 or affordable, good fits. Uh, and they start doing a lot of research on specific fits because every animal, or every species needs a different kind of fit, not only in the formulation, but in the physical properties. So you need there is a species like tilapia that need floating feeds, so you need to deliver the feed that need to be floating. So this is a special technology to, to produce floating feeds. For shrimps, we need sinking feeds because they, they, they feed in the bottom. And they are species that use semi-sinking feed. So it sinks very slowly because the, water, the, the animal are in the whole column, like salmon and everything, you know? So the technologies, for producing the feed have been changing a lot in the last 15 years. From pellets to extrusion, and for extrusion, from producing floating, sinking, and then sinking. Extrusion in general is better than pelletizing, uh, but not, but extrusion has just recently, the extrusion could develop or produce sinking feeds. Uh, which is uh, paramount for, for, for shrimp uh, culture. So now the feeding companies that produce 
feed for shrimps are changing from pelletizing to extrusion. The two main challenges, and I, I told you for, for the feeds, be, besides a good formula, is avoiding bleaching and putting the attractant, the correct attractant to make animals to eat them, right? And leaching is a big problem. Leaching <coughs> is, has, implies, first of all, that you pollute your water. So it's, it's a very pollutant source, phosphorus and nitrogen. Secondly, you lose the vitamins and you lose a lot of nutritional factors if the, if the feed leaches a lot and the animals do not get what they need. So leaching probably is the main problem when you want to make a good quality feed. You have to avoid leaching as much as possible. You cannot avoid completely because it's impossible because you're working in a uh, water environment. But you need, your feed has to be good enough to keep your leaching very low on, up to three hours. Because the animals, two, three hours. Less than one hour, it's going to be bad. You need to keep it a good stability, good stability up to three hours. Because the animals continue eating there. So if you if, if you don't if your if your stability is not good the first three hours, you probably will will go out of business. And the second thing is attractants. You have to have good attractants so your animal or the or the fishes or the animal you're working with likes your feed. Because you have you could have very good formula, you have very very good producing systems, you avoid leaching, but the animal don't like your feed, you are done. So you have to put good, good attractants so the animal likes your feet. So these things to me are the most important thing for a good quality feed in production. Then we have ingredients, right? And that is formulation. And formulation is a little bit of magic there. Still in agriculture, we still have a, a, a bit of magic in, 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 in agriculture. It's not in poultry, not in pigs. Because that is most of the of the mix mixtures, but in, in aquaculture still every company has its own magic on that. The first challenge that we are facing now with with feeds is animal protein, fish in, fish out. You know, we cannot produce less fish from the fish we extract from the environment to feed our fish, right? That, that will be a, that 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 give us a negative equation in agriculture, and we don't want a negative equation in agriculture. We need a positive. We need to be better. We need always trying to use less resources for capture uh, animals, for capture for capture animals in the sea or in the, in, in in fresh water. So what you produce in tons in the feed. You need to have to be less than you, what you uh, extract from the natural resources. So your 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 the, the use of fish meal in 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 aquaculture feed has to be needs to be always less and less. So um, we are talking about vegetable proteins replacement of fish meal with vegetable proteins. But vegetable protein has a lot of anti-nutritional factors. Um, it's not very much, it's not very effective for, for, for uh, carnivorous species like salmon or, or, or trough, even uh, catfish. Um, it's, more, it's much more uh, um, effective in tilapia. I think tilapia is almost vegetable protein. Um, but for shrimp, it's, 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 it's still in studies. Um, but if you want to replace, and again, the economic, economic question, you want to replace the fish meal with, with, with other source of protein. This other source of protein needs to be affordable in terms of volumes, 
and price. If there is no volumes or price to replace fish meal, will, will that happen? If you are a fish meal producer and, um, and um, you want to make profits, you will not change your fish meal for a, for a source that you cannot find or easy find, or is for a source that is more expensive. Because the farmer will not, or some farmer will not accept that, will not understand that by having these kind of things, you will have less impact in farming. So if the fish, if the fish company, if the feed companies wants to do that, they have to be, they have to be a national policy or a world policy that force the farmers and the producers to do the, to, to do so. I mean, to use uh, uh, sources of um, protein that are not, or that are, that are environmental friendly, or at least um, sustainable, right? Now we are talking about renders. Renders could be a good source, and they are affordable. This is your renders is the waste of the poultry, poultry industry or a pig and everything. And now we are talking about insect meal. Insect meal pro probably would be the way to go, but right now it's expensive. Yeah, I mean, it's high, it's good quality, very good quality. But it's expensive, and their volumes are not there. So if if if, if I am a, a, a feed producer and I tell, okay, guys, um, I want uh, 10, uh, 10 tons per month or 150 tons per month of your sick meal, nobody is able now to to supply, right? That is something that is starting these uh, insect meal companies to start building up the capacity on industrial, in, the, in a, a industrial size or, or, or not. Um, all right. As important or probably more important right now from than the feed production technology ingredients is the feeding strategies. Um, you could have the best feed, you got the, 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 the best feed in ingredients and in, in, in feed production technology. But if you deliver your feed incorrectly, or you store them incorrectly, or you use correctly, you are not doing anything. It's important for to understand that the feeding strategies are as important as the ingredients and feed production technologies. And more now that you have new genetics. Every year, every two years, you have a new genetics coming out in your pipeline. And these animals, and the animal change, and the feed should change, and the feeding strategy should change. You cannot feed an animal, a high growth animal, or a high produce animal as the same way as you feed 20 years ago. You have to change the way you feed the animals. You have to change the feed formulation as well. Probably need more energy. Probably they need more protein. Because they are the animals that build muscle much faster, are more aggressive for the feed. They are more competitive. So you need to change your strategies on feeding as well, and husbandry as well. So now we are having auto feeders that deliver the feed just a settled time. You, you, you program your 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 feed feeder based on time every x amount of minutes or hours or seconds but you don't know anything about your animal there just you guess you know that you are feeding constantly which is good it's better than than keeping animals uh, hungry so you deliver feed all every one two minutes small amounts is better than giving the same amount of feed three times per day. First of all, the animals suffer less from hunger, are less, uh, less uh, aggressive. Secondly, the leaching is less because the, 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 the feed is used in a better way. And secondly, um, you're keeping the nutrients in the feed better. Uh, and of course, 
you have less competition in the pan. You are giving them more energy. You don't make your animals suffer from hungry. You have to understand starvation is not there, which is much better in terms of feed efficiency. But you don't know anything about the behavior of animal. You, you don't know if they're animal are, are, are eating or not. So there is a lot of feeders that actually evaluate the behavior of the animal when they feed, when they don't feed. So there are softwares that actually are looking at your animals and say, okay, the animals are eating right now. Okay, let's put, give, me, give them more feed. And they, they, then they, they start eating, and then when they stop eating, the, the software and the camera says, okay, the animals stop eating, do not deliver anymore. Let's wait a little bit. Or just put a little, little bit amount of feed. And then they start feeding again, and so on and so on. So they, they, they are auto feeders now, they are using artificial, artificial intelligence with sound, and they are, or cameras, or, or sound, and that, that they deliver the feed on demand and based on their behavior. And that you make your feeding um, strategy much more efficient is you are looking at your production not as a as a whole thing but an individual feed a fish feeding strategy and you see that in, in very well in salmon so you this is the feeder that you program per, per time then is the feeders that are programmed by echo sound so when they, they it hears the, the animal eating and when it hears animal eating they deliver the feed when it they stop eating because they don't hear anymore. It stops delivering the feed. And this is the, 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 the other one that is delivers the feed. The, the uneaten feed is here counted. And if they uneaten, uh, they put a threshold in the, in the counted feed that is going up here, and it's too much, it stops feeding. When it's too less, they start feeding again. And you can monitor now, you see in salmon is very, very developed. You see every animal eating there, and you see they are eating or not eating. You can deliver or not deliver. It's so everything program software with artificial intelligence that are now doing all these things for you. Okay. Norway, in, 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 in our developing countries, in Thailand, in Colombia, in around India, the labor is cheap, so you can use people to deliver the feed, but they are not, they, 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 they deliver the feed by guests. You know, <laughs> it's a little bit uh, not not so technically. In Norway, it's one person managing six hundred thousand tons per trip. Uh, so it's one person or two person doing all the job with technology, right? So feeding is now as important as formulation and feed production. All right, now we start with uh, the fun part. Uh, I know if you want to have a small break for a toilet break. <laughs> uh, what is the time now? I, I haven't checked that, uh, Dr. Grappo. I don't have time. How, how long have I been doing this? What time is now? I don't have a watch here in my... Uh, let me see. Uh, sorry. Uh, two, two. Okay, well, we we are out running out of time, right? Yeah, I, yeah. Sorry, there sorry, is still uh, time. We have only what uh, half hour? Yeah, we have used almost one hour forty minutes now in your lecture. Okay, okay, okay. So, okay, let's 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 um, uh, do it that more quickly. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay. In, 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 in hatcheries, what has been the game changer here is the reproduction technologies, control reproduction. That, without that, we cannot supply or produce seeds, right? <laughs> Fingerlings. Uh, so we have natural extrapolation, artificial insemination, mouse spawning, individual spawning, individual spawning, right? So, um, it's, it's, it's important that, or was very, very important in the past to have the control of these parts. And, uh, sorry. Okay. 
Um, in the hatcheries also, uh, is was very important to improve the whole brain technologies, like artificial incubation, artificial hatching, temperature control. I mean, without these, we, we have to have good quality seed. Without a good quality seed, you won't have a good crop. It's not only the genetics. You have to have good quality fingerlings, good quality PLs, if you want to success. And that's important. Nutrition, husbandry, and technologies need to be there. So we have now the possibility to have microencapsulations, to have a very good nutrition. We are now working with Artemia embryos, which is the Artemia, but non descapsulated and, and ready to use, and live feed like macroalgae, Artemia, and Rotifers. I mean, that has been very, need to be done in a very good way with good, very good quality and with good, very good well management, right? So these technologies, or the improvement in these procedures give us a very high fecundity because agricultural species in general have a very good fecundity. I mean, with good fecundity, you could actually produce mass fingerlings and mass larvae, a lot of them. And that changed the agriculture industry a lot, the availability of the seed, right? But what is the problem with that, with this massive high fecundity and massive production? Risk of inbreeding, very high risk. Why? Because one single female could give you the whole production. One single spawn, for instance, in salmon or in shrimps or in, uh, in cobia or, or, or this, not in, not in uh, tilapia, but in many species, very few females and very few animals could produce the whole, the whole production. And if you want to use those animals again on the offsprings as breeders, you will end with high inbreeding with a lot of problems in deformities, reproduction, survival, and all these things. So you need, is here when people understood that we were genetics and genetic management start being important, right? It's not only improving the traits, improving the production, but avoiding problems with inbreeding and reduction of genetic variability. In general, this is a, a, a graph that probably you have seen many times. It's how genetics and genetic improvement has been helping or increasing the productivity of the aquatic species. In, in chicken, cattle, and pigs has been steady, not much, but because the high fecundity and the possible of making the science as we wanted, and artificial insemination, that the, the productivity in these three main species has been very high, due only to the genetics. So, what kind of genetics would we have? We have two main areas. We have genomic strategies and conventional breeding, which is selection. Right? These are the two main things. We have been fighting each other for many years. The genomic people and molecular genetics, they, 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 they try or they try to sell the technology saying that you can find a gene or the super shrimp or the super animal. Uh, and we as, 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 as breeders you know that's not possible. We need a lot of information. It's better to do selection and, and, and create your own population and select from those populations and blah, blah, blah. So we have two main areas. From a genomic strategy, you have chromosome manipulation, gene, gene, gene transfer, GMOs, um, in other conventional breeding by selection and growth breeding. But now we have, finally, we end with, uh, with something that helps that work for both. I mean, finally, genomic strategies combined with selection gave, uh, came with what we call genomic selection and gene editing. And I'm going to talk a little bit on that. Uh, mass select, uh, uh, well, in selection, you have mass selection, um, where you test the whole animal, you select the best ones based on the individual characteristics. You don't have, you don't have pedigree, you don't have, you don't, you don't know from which animal they are coming, those animals. 
mother and father, just select, and you produce the next generations. That is very effective for growth, but you could end with inbreeding if you don't have pedigree. Now, now, again, with molecular technologies, we could have DNA fingerprinting, and we could actually know from which father or mother could came those animals. And we could build a pedigree based on molecular technology. That is why I'm saying now we are working together finally. We are, the molecular tool came as a, molecular technology came as a tool for selection. And when we have family selection, where you have a many different uh, male and uh, families, and each family, you could have the, the that is the, the, the beauty of the family selection, that you could actually test the same family for different traits. And you could build a population that could be better or, or, or have genuine response for many traits. Um, mass selections only give you one choice of small choices. Family selection give you much broader choices with the same population, right? So most of the uh, companies or most of the breeding companies are using family selection right now instead of mass selection. And that is what you call genomic selection. Genomic selection is based on a platform that discovered single nucleal polyformis as a markers. And we could have thousands, thousands of those in the genome, millions, I mean, I mean the millions of these SNPs are in the genome, even though the genome is very similar from each other. We share 99% of the genome from each, from, 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 in, from the same species, but we still could identify these small differences in the genome. And we have millions of that. And we can use these differences in the genome to um, identify, identify some characteristics in the phenotype that we want. So we can use these differences in the genome and compare with the phenotypic information, right? And you print into, for instance, you, you have a small uh, 50,000 SNP sheet, 50,000 markers, and use these 50,000 50, markers in every animal, and then you record the phenotypic information, growth, disease resistance, fertility, and then you are trying to find associations between these um, um, markers and the trait. In general, there is very, low or small traits that are affected by single genes. Most of them are affected by a lot of genes, polynomial genes. Um, a lot of genes are from small effects are affecting the trait in general. And with these um, SNPs or markers, we can identify these small effects as a whole, right? Because we have a lot of information. Normally what we do, for, for instance, in, in disease resistance, what we do in, 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 uh, in Sayakwa, we, we develop a 50,000 SNP sheet that we already test for two generations for EMS, open resistance. What we do is we genotype the training populations, is the, the populations that we infect, and we genotype the clean animals, the seedlings in the breeding nucleus. We genotype the high tens these two populations. This one we infect with the virus or with the bacteria. We get the information. We uh, have the information of death or alive or time to death. And then we can actually select these animals based on the information of those ones individually, individually. Before we only had the family means. Now we have the individuals that have exactly the same profile in genotypes or a genomic than this one that survived. So we can select, we can have G blocks or G, G breeding values, genomic breeding values from, and from families. So we can identify individuals within the family that would survive 
if I would infect them. So that increases the, the, the accuracy of selection by 15%, which is a lot. Again, small improvements at the big scales are very big in the industry. So the genomic selection is now uh, giving all the tools to select individually animals that might be survived in a challenge test. The same we could uh, work with fertility or with survival in different ponds on different environments. So that is made very much for those traits that you don't can test your breeding candidates. That is very effective for traits where the breeding candidate need or, or the tested animal cannot become a breeding candidate, right? So, which species are using this kind of uh, technology? Is it already Atlantic salmon, uh, blind, tilapia for this disease resistance, and pinnitus venomi? And these are just an uh, example of how many SNPs markers you need to have an effective estimate or heritability. This says, before they say that with 50,000, you should have a good estimate. Now, people, because that's expensive, this is expensive technology. If we could reduce to probably 4,000, 3,000 markers per animal, it would be very good because it will save us a lot of money. This is expensive. We pay like $20 per animal. So I we imagine we, we genotype 5,000 animals per generation or per trait per, per quart is a lot of money, a lot of money. Okay, gene editing. That is the part for, uh, uh, last part. Gene editing is, uh, maybe you, you haven't heard about Casper, these, these technologies, in, the technology is based on inducing mutations where, that might be occur in the nature, but you, might, you, you induce a mutation that you want in your population, right? So you edit your, your DNA, but it's a mutation that might be occur or not, but you use it to produce better animals. In this case, it's a, it's, it's a gene that regulates muscle growth. Looks horrible, but could be very, very effective for prediction. I don't like it, but anyway, it's there. And has been applied lovely in a test. So where you have the two alleles from the mutation, you have a much higher fillet yield than the non-mutated fishes. So this is a very promising technology for us, but with some concerns. The regulation is still not there. We don't know about the consumer perception. It's a costly, and it only works in such traits that are affected by a small number of genes. So we cannot use it for traits like disease resistance or, this, or, 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 or traits that are affected by a lot of genes with small effect. It only works for traits that are affected by a small number of genes with big effect. Okay. Conclusions. There is a, an increase in demand of aquatic products worldwide. The traditional capture can't supply such demand. Agriculture products are rapidly filling the gap. Big investment has been adding installed capacity. In order to be profitable and sustainable, the industry has been investing in new, in new production technologies. Basic supplies like seeds and seeds have been spending a lot of research to meet the producers and consumer requirements. And environmental management and low input will play a big role in the future. And I want to make my last sense on that. Good practices is not only profits that we need in our culture to implement good practices. We have to take into account the environment a lot because it could be our best friend but the environment could be also our worst enemy. So if we don't take care of environment, we will be in, in a big trouble and would hit us badly. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Thomas. You, you have really, really uh, given a lot of uh, exposure and insight of the industry, right from the culture to requirements 
and the scientific background of this, that how it happens. And I am very sure that uh, my students and faculty members must be having few queries or uh, would like to interact with you. Maybe a few questions we can take. Yes, yes, sure. No worries. Yeah. Any one of you would like to ask or interact with some clarification or some doubts, some suggestions, some input? There are some questions posted in the chat section by a few students. Okay. Why should I do it? Stop sharing. Okay. Okay. Now I can see you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it was longer than I expected. Um, uh, I put a lot of effort to give you the best information I had. Uh, and well, if, if I have time to, to answer the question you need, if your students still have time. Yeah, yeah. Time is there. Time is not an issue. Uh, actually, we. Uh, the things which we have told about the culture and the systems and the development of the industry, that is really very fantastic. And I, I, I think that our people would like to venture into it because all the time going to the, uh, whatever you learn and when it comes to the application aspects, mm -hmm. that, that need to be learned from those who are really in the industry. Mm -hmm. So that is something very, very different and eye-opening to all of them. Dr. Jagirda, Dr. Sahu, Rupam Sharma, Muzahid, Dr. Gayatri, my heads of the divisions. If somebody would like to ask any aspect from him, what he has discussed. Yeah, Professor Thomas, that is uh, a question in chat box. Oh, that, that's okay. Yeah. <clears throat> you can read it out. Yeah, so first question is how to control diseases in open water culture, that is open cage or sea or lake? It's, uh, that's a big challenge. I think um, I, I will put the example on shrimps, uh, uh, um, the difference between uh, Americas, uh, Central and South America and Asia is in Central America, they, they have huge funds uh, where they cannot really apply uh, good biosecurity measures in that, in that and, and, and avoiding diseases. What they did with some or with good success, because now for instance, Ecuador is producing a lot of shrimps, they de developed a genetic strain that could scope and resist all these pathogens. <laughs> Mainly, they have a very they, they had a very strong selection in in the, in the at the end of the last century, going through a very strong selection intensity of selection for white spot. Um, the, the difference between Asia how they manage white spot and and the Americas is in Asia they tried to avoid the disease in 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 uh, the Americas they couldn't do it they tried but they couldn't do it so they decided to to breed the survivors from those highly affected plants. I mean, what, from, from million, they had only very, very few. It's one, less than 1% one of selection intensity. Those survivors, they have been breeding for many generations so far, and those are showing a very good resistance against white spot. And they are now actually, they, 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 they change, I mean, they, 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 they improve from 0.0, .0 one person survival, and now they are reaching like 60 to 70 percent survival in the same pots without changing much of the culture, but changing the genetics. That takes a long time, a lot of resources, a lot of money. The best way, the, 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 again, the best way is to, to, to avoid the disease, but in open waters, in open system, is is really difficult. It's very difficult. I would. In that case, it depends on the disease you are getting affected with using probiotics. That is possible. Uh, immune enhance, again, I, is something that uh, I have been working on that could work as prophylactic, as therapeutic, like garlic, for instance. Garlic seems to be working very well. Uh, it's not expensive. 
um, you, 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 you chop it and you give it as a, a, a feed, one of the feedings, it, it works. Uh, but not all the time, it depends, again, it, it much depends on the disease you're working with or, or you're affecting with. Uh, yeah, Thomas, how are you? This is hey, hey, hey. Yes, good to see you. Yeah, nice meeting you again after a long time. Yes. Uh, uh, two quick questions. Uh, one is uh, for the genomic selection, all the species that you have mentioned, they were all uh, high value fishes. What about yes. the programs for the high volume but uh, low price? Uh, uh, this one. Yeah, you're uh, talking about carbs. There is some work in carbs you saw in the, in, in the last slide. Um, we, if, if in the e game, it's, 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 it's a model of cost and benefit. Uh, this is expensive technology. Um, we're still in the, in, the, in, the, in the process of evaluating in um, proving, proving what the theory is, 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 is telling us. In theory, genomic selection uh, is very interesting. It actually, it has been applying in, 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 in dairy cattle and in cattle a long time ago with good success. But we have to prove that in, in aquaculture. How much are we really gaining uh, in terms of, of jelly gain and, 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 and long time response compared with the investment we are doing? Um, with low value animals, uh, I, I am afraid that that technology could be more expensive than the profit you could get at the end. And, and, and when the equation is negative, there is no business. So, as a researcher, we would like to do all this research because it's fun. But at the end, we don't breathe for fun. We breathe to make or to help the industry in having better profit or having a better animal where even the small, small farmers could make better incomes, right? Um, when, when, when your seed, because that technology is expensive, your seed become more expensive and you don't see really that benefit in your funds, then I would say not, not, not or, 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 or the, benefit, the benefit you see in your funds do not, is, is less than the increase in your seed price. I would, I would say you have to be very careful. So we need to prove that the benefits that you get from German selection is going to be bigger than the increasing cost in the production. Uh, second one, how are you seeing the future for the monodon or whether it is almost finished? No, no, no. I think monodon, <laughs> um, I, I shouldn't say this, um, but I see a big, you know that monodon now is in nature, is, is wild in, in the Americas, right? And some of the seed comes into the ponds by, with the water. Some finger it. And they do extremely good in the modern, in the Panama ponds. I see that probably in that kind of systems with low densities, uh, already animals that are resistant to white spot, it could be a very good option. Very good option. Um, I think it grows well. I think uh, if you could control the, um, the, the reproduction in a good way, which has been a challenge so far, but now with the genomic tools like, like uh, fingerprinting and parental assignment, I think it could be much easier to really create a breeding population that you could select for. Um, I probably would. Um, do a little bit of what was done in Maradon, in, in Panama, in Ecuador, probably 
go through three or four generations of very intensive selection uh, for white spot um, uh, using uh, survivors and then clean the population with double strain RNA uh, and then start, that could actually be a game changer in modern. You need to control breeding and to create a, a, a population that could be more resistant to white spot. To me, if that is possible, Modern will come up again very, very, very big, very strong. Thank you. Thank you. Doctor Rubajurba, any other question in the chat box? Yes, sir, that is one. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of problems you faced uh, while doing genomic selection? Well, first, uh, again, with, with all breeding strategy, you need very good phenotypic information, very good quality phenotypic information. If you want to select for disease resistance, you need to have a very good, well, very well designed challenge test where you could actually, where, where, where you could ensure that the animal that died, died because the disease you want to select for and because the animal that survived again, survived again the disease. Not because other factors when you do the challenge test. That's the important. If you don't, if you don't manage correctly the, the challenge testing and you are sure on, on the phenotypic results, genomic selection do not work. Again, when you put this information together and they don't match and you get a genomic value <laughs> on wrong phenotypic information, you will not get progress. The key point is having good phenotypic, good high quality, high quality phenotypic information. In that way, genomic selection works very well. If you don't, it's, it's, it's going to be a problem. To me, that is the main, the, the main, the main problem. The second, of course, is, is we need to train more people on, on, on how to deal with genomic data. So research, uh, more training capacity or, 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 or uh, coaching needs to be done on, on bioinformatics. Uh, and um, Treating of genomic data this is the second. I think we need people that is not much people there. I think it's a very good area to, to, to get specialized if your students want to do, go through that area. It's bioinformatics. Um, and the other point is, is, is cost. I mean, the, the cost needs to be reduced. Otherwise, uh, cost of, geno of, geno of genotyping. Genotyping cost need to be reduced. Okay, I think Dr. Mujahid has got a question. Dr. Mujahid. Yeah, yeah thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Thomas, uh, very well presentation. It was uh, indeed a pleasure listening to you. I have a, a small query, like, uh, you know, we are a developing country and uh, most of the family-based breeding, breeding programs which are countable in India are uh, supported by government agencies rather than the industries. Even though there is a lot of potential, but uh, industrial level funding is lacking here. And this usually prohibits uh, the scientific boom in aquaculture production. So what is your suggestion or the way forward for uh, such uh, programs in uh, the countries where the breeding is uh, yeah, funded? Yeah. By <laughs> that, is, that, that is a very good question and is a very good question to, to answer because I don't know. I know why the industry has not been investing and probably they, 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 they don't, they, they are afraid of, of, of doing themselves, lack of uh, self-confidence probably, or confidence in the, in, the, in, the, in the governmental entities. That's another thing. And that happens in my country as well. Uh, um, they trust more uh, uh, companies that are big companies from abroad, from, from the developed countries. Um, but yes, that is, that is a pity. I mean, uh, uh, I think that the, the, the scientific capacity in India is, is good, is 
much very good to be able to 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 get the funding from the from the industry but uh, i don't know uh, it, it's 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 the same in every country in thailand well in thailand they, they, they was cp but thailand is not the case actually thailand the opposite you need to have a big company like cp to to in thailand a big big company that drives that change that has the economic capacity and and the self confidence i would say the self confidence to do the job thank you thank you for that <clears throat> Rupam sir, it is mute. Oh yeah, yeah. Thank you. Ah, uh, then one last question. That is, how much intensity or how much productivity is too much, where we are creating more harm to nature than benefits? Difficult question. It depends very much on the species, on the technology that you're using, because you could actually have a very, very intense productivity. uh without harming environment because actually you could for instance fresh fresh water is is different from 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 marine environment with fresh water all the waste of your production could be used as um fertilizer for other crops for instance we are working a project with tilapia where all the water that is exchanged going out goes and fertilize tomato tomato fields has a lot of nitri nitrogen has a lot of phosphorus and it can be extremely well used as fertilizers or aquaponics to other crops and then at the end you have zero inputs into the environment because your water after leaving all the nutrients in your in your plant crop goes almost clean to your river again so it depends very much on the technology you're using i think the technology is more important than the biomass you can have use bio, you can use very well very good technologies you you, have, you you just bring in and bring out the water to the river then you you pollute a lot then i would suggest to use very low density very very small biomass i cannot give you a number but if you that, if if that water that you are throwing away first of all you can reuse it the first one you use it by by filtration or kind of uh, yeah or you can you use it for other things in agriculture purposes then you don't harm them you are not harming actually the environment but helping it Uh, okay, uh, Doctor Thomas, such a very good presentation. Uh, maybe the last question I will ask because you may be tired after two hours of lectures. No, uh, no, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, just my question would be different. Uh, that uh, that uh, we know that uh, unless otherwise industries are involved, there will be no progress in the sector. But you know that is involvement of industries. Um, Will be different in different countries, maybe developed country, developing country, or underdeveloped countries. Uh, so uh, my question will be: uh, How this uh, industry, academic institutes, and students will work together? Uh, it's it's a very important question, a very very important question, and and and. i see in general in general uh, uh, um besides norway i have said besides norway a very uh, a, a, a small complementary work between the, the 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 industry and the research institution which is wrong look at norway what he done you know the 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 research that norway has done for instance with nofima is half sponsored by the industry if you involve the industry sponsoring your research then you start bringing them into into your hands you know how sponsored by the by the by the industry how sponsored by the government if the research is 100 sponsored by the government the industry is out 
of the decisions of what is done, need to be done, first of all, and they are not interested. Uh, uh, and they end, again, it ends in nice, very nice publications, important publications, but they don't go beyond that. So you want your research to be, uh, to have an impact. You need to bring the industry together. They have to drive what kind of research needs to be done. And they need to pay for that. How sponsored by them. Right? That has been done by Norway. And actually has been done also in, in Thailand with CP. CP sponsored a lot of research from Centex Institute. And, 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 and they did work together very well. We also, sure, not to play. Sayakwa works with Centex very well. We, we have a lot of projects with them together. All sponsored by the government, all sponsored by us. But it's our own. We decide which research sponsor if we see a benefit of doing it at the end, right? That is the key. So you need, the industry needs to know, needs to feel that the, the research that you're doing is, 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 is going to have some benefits. And you can bring them and probably will pay very, very happily if they see that it's going to help them a lot. Yeah, I agree. You know, that is, uh, the Norway is the best example of uh, how the R&D they are using for their culture. Mm. And uh, similarly, you know, that is in uh, most of the countries, the big companies, they only believe on R&D. So that's why they spend more on R&D. But mm. uh, um, many companies, they are um, not willing or unable to spend more on R&D because they're small companies. Mm -hmm. When the percentage of these companies are more in a country, so there the involvement of uh, academic industries, the gap is there. Mm -hmm. So that's, a, that's why this model cannot be applied uh, universally. No, I agree. I agree. I agree. But then, but then, but anyway, in some way, the industry need to be involved in the in, in some of the decisions that the, the academy, the research, or the academy is doing in research, the objectives, because you need to have the, some something. When when I was working in Colombia, which is the same case in India, the the the, the sponsors, the, the the government sponsors decided not to sponsor small projects, but programs. It's not the small, it has to be a program that has to be with objectives for 10 years. Because you don't have a, a, a program or research that goes more than five years, at the end you don't end with something you could bring to the industry or sell. Yeah. You have to sponsor programs, a long-term long -term research where you could find the solution at the end. Because small things, you, if you start, let's see, I don't think that it's, no, it's, it, you can have a very good research project for nutrition and you end with a very good results or a very nice publication. But you don't continue with that research to get the final product. Uh, whatever you did before is, 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 is useless for the industry. Not for the research, not for the academy, but, but for, for, for the industry. You need to build programs together with the industry, programs that helps everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Dr. Sau, what you asked, that, that is really, uh, we have to look into that how well we are able to integrate our activities or the research out, output with the industry. Of course, in all the countries and all the places, there are different types of industry and their thought process and how best they are getting the output from the research institutions. So these, all the factors need to be seen into because industry will put their money only where they see that possibly there are the benefits out of the research outcome from the institutions. So that, that, that thing needs to be developed together. If that is not the case, in, in that in situation, situation, it will be very difficult to come out with the linkages with them. We have to see that how the other countries and the research institutions are developing linkages with the industry and whether we can follow that model or not. 
so that that is to be seen and we have already seen from the presentation of uh, dr uh, thomas that working with the industry having the background of the scientific strong scientific base and applying that so that we get the advantage else it becomes very difficult serving in the industry and becoming a icon also that is very important our students and our faculty members must take the cue from here if we are going to put our hand in industry want to become an entrepreneur what are the intricacies in that and how those intricacies are to be followed or ruled or we have to see that how we are going to work on those things important aspect of it and before it is the formal word of thanks i would like to say that uh, dr thomas your presentation was excellent this has given lot of exposure and insight of the industry and how our colleagues should work on those lines to imbibe the outcome of your research outcome of your experience and outcome of your work which you are doing so diligently for the last number of years i remember it is 20 but it is not 20 it has to be more than 25 or 30 years mm. uh, during which you are continuously working and supporting and leading the industry i am really very very thankful to you and my thanks to my colleagues to formal word of thanks by dr rupam sharma and i see that many of my colleagues who are the part of nahep they are here my hods my nodal officer my joint director and everybody so that is great consolation that everybody is listening you so intensely that they should get something out of it thank you thank you very much rupam sharma oh, thank thank you thank you dr gopal for inviting me i i hope that the presentation fulfill fulfill the expectations um um, um but um i i i i give this presentation presentation from my from my own experience and the heart i feel uh the industry has been helping or what is needed still i think there's a lot of things that is still needed we are in, in we need a lot of research we need a lot of help from from the academy uh we still need uh, i mean we 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 really um have a need for the academy to be together with us and solve many of the problems I think that is that is very important because we don't have as as many but they say some of the companies we are too small to do our own research. We need centers or research centers to do the research for us, but for in in, in with with objectives that are helping us to be better or more competitive, right? That is it, and 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 I I put. Bring a little bit the experience I had in Colombia. In Colombia, they decided to create the research, the the the, the production um, um, associations, the producers. They made associations, and these associations create their own research center. For instance, they have a center of research of coffee, coffee research center. Mm -hmm. So this this is sponsored 50% by the producers and 50% by 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 the government sugarcane research center aquaculture research center uh palm oil research center they have many of them that are 50% sponsored by the industry even even i am a small farmer i'm in part of the association and this association is sponsored in a big way mm. because they are doing research to make the country more competitive it's not individual companies so all the companies sponsor research to make the country more competitive so probably you need to have an association in agriculture that creates the research center right yeah that is true true hmm. yes And and of course I was very happy to give that thing. Actually, it was a pleasure. It was very fun preparing it. I I have fun. Spent two three days or more.
preparing it, but it was a big fun. It was a big fun. Not only preparing, but giving it. You, you must have spent a lot of time to prepare the presentation. I did, but uh, it was. Yeah. <laughs> I hope. I hope. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Thomas. And we, we, we could see by your presentation, like right from history to genomic selection. So you have you have not left anything uh, that we should know, or I, I'm sure that our students and faculty members are immensely benefited. And uh, I'm sure that you will be receiving so many communications, especially from our students, for uh, their guidance, maybe uh, in their near future. And we do look forward for your collaboration with uh, us in the future uh, endeavors. And uh, uh, Really, we heartfelt thanks to uh, you, sir. You really uh, made it a day. And uh, you woke up early in the morning and uh, really <laughs> took pain for us and uh, delivered such a wonderful talk. And the brain behind this talk is our uh, Honorable Director and Vice Chancellor, Dr. Gopal Krishna. Uh, sir, uh, heartfelt thanks to you for organizing this and uh, guiding us to conduct this program successfully. The pillar behind this program is uh, Dr. Joint, uh, our joint director and pedagogy component leader, Dr. N.P. Sahu. And we extend our heartfelt thanks to you, Sahu, sir. I thank all the participants, especially the faculty members, students. I have seen many CIF alumni and also students and alumni of different fisheries colleges across the country. So I thank everyone for taking part in the uh, discussion also. And I have no words to thank our pedagogy team uh, members, especially Dr. Shashi Bhushan, Dr. Saurav, Dr. Shamna, uh, Mr. Bumaya, then uh, Nuzaiba, and also Dr. Muzahid Patan for timely help in conducting this program. Special thanks to our IT group uh, for arranging the uh, lectures. Last but not the least, I thank the National Director and National Coordinator of NAHEP New Delhi and the entire CIF NAHEP team, including the Nodal Officer Dr. Gaitri Tripathi for their guidance and help. And uh, finally, I thank one and all present here and uh, wish you a very good night and wish Dr. Thomas a very good day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Thomas. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And all the, the best, best for everyone. I, uh, stay safe, eh? everyone. Please stay yeah. safe. You too. You too. You too. Take you care. Too. And too. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Have a good thank day. Thank you very much. I will answer here. Uh, Uh, going to give me my email here. I got to write my email here in the messages so they can send me direct questions, all right? Yeah, that's good, that's good. All right, I'm going to be, give you my private email. Sure. All right. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Gopal. Thank you very much, eh? and uh, we keep in touch. Eh? Sure, sure, sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.